Welcome to In Conversation. Good morning to our studio in Australia. They're already up, and we already have a question from Marilyn McIntyre there. Good day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Marilyn McIntyre. Hi, Phil Evans. Hello, everybody here live and also on Facebook. On Facebook, please like our page. Please share our page. Please let everyone you know who's interested in the acting profession tune in, send us questions. We'll be answering questions from the live audience and also from Facebook. I am delighted to welcome to the studio producer, director, longtime friend. He loves the business. He loves actors. He has so much of his own story to share with us. Please welcome Emil Levizetti. Thank you. Thank you. Emil, my first question to you is, how did you come to be? <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> Um, all right, so I graduated school, went back to Chicago, and uh, did theater, uh, wanted to be an actor, uh, did industrials and commercials, um, and uh, not good theater, by the way, um, <laughs> not Stephen Wolf, not Goodman, um, and ultimately at about 25, I ended up answering an ad in the paper. Um, for uh, they needed an actor who played trumpet, and I had happened to play trumpet for 13 years. I hadn't played in probably 10 or 12. So I pulled out my old trumpet and I started practicing, and yeah. I went to the audition, and uh, he said, well, you're trumpet playing not so much, but we'd like you to come back tomorrow to read for a different role. I read for that role, and I ended up getting the role of Joe Venuti, who was a jazz violinist in a small indie Italian movie called Bix, that was done by a very famous Italian director named Pupi Avati. Uh, Pupi. <laughs> P U P I. Pupi. <laughs> but he had done just the year before a great movie called Storia di Ragazzi e di Ragazze. Ragazzi e Ragazze. Um, story of Boys and Girls, which had done quite well, and he'd done some 20-some movies, very well known. So I ended up doing that in Davenport, Iowa, with a bunch of 25-year-old guys and girls, and we had a fabulous time. It ended up going to the Cannes Film Festival in competition as the Italian entry. It was the year that Barton Fink and uh, Madonna's Truth or Dare was there. So except for the people at the Palais de Festival, my mother, my friends, nobody saw it. <laughs> um, I guess though one producer did see it uh, or the producer's wife um, and thought I would be good in a, in a movie out here and about three months later I got a call to fly out to LA and audition for a movie with Shannon Tweed you guys remember her? anybody? am I too old? <laughs> um, yeah, you probably know her as married to Gene Simmons back in the day she also had she was famous for other reasons as well. Uh -huh. I got that role, um, and uh, you know, within about I think 48 hours, was simulating sex next to the Hollywood Reservoir in front of the camera. Um, I proceeded to do. Did he tell you that I was going to be colorful? <laughs> <laughs> I proceeded to get a career in Roger Corman movies. Uh, where my best lines were generally stop or I'll shoot and then they would go, really? <laughs> um, and at the same time, uh, met Howard and started studying with Howard um, and ultimately administrating, running his studio um, for about four years. Thank God, because that taught me I couldn't be an actor anymore. Um, <laughs> I was better at running a studio than I was at acting. Um, and I was tired of, you know, going to parties and talking to my friends and them asking, they say, oh, you're doing a movie, you're, what are you working on? I was like, oh, never mind. You know, I, would, I wasn't proud of my work. Um, nor do I think I should have been, by the way, when I look back. So it's, you know, I, I was doing okay. I was making a, some money and... Uh, being supported by Howard's as well, salary, luckily, running the studio. So, um, but we actually had a real heart to heart. And, and it was something Howard said. He said, you know, some of the most successful people I know make course corrections along, along the way. And he said, 
you know, just that's allowed. You can make a course correction. I've been at it 10 years. Um, and I've had a moderate amount of success, you know, in that I was working. I've done probably 12 or 15 of these movies. Um, I've done commercials. I've done industrials. I've done bad theater. So, but for me, I looked forward to my career, and, and, and I didn't want, I thought in the best, best scenario, maybe I'd get a couple pilots, and then those wouldn't go, and maybe then I'd get a series, and I'd get six or ten episodes, and then that, and I, I started forecasting ahead, and I said, I don't want to wait that long. Um, I happened to have a lot of people that I knew, a lot of friends, who were in the television development game. Um, at studios, at networks, all over the place. But nonetheless, the first thing I did is I, I basically interviewed everybody and anybody I knew in the industry, agents, managers, casting directors, producers, line producers, film executives, TV executives, um, you name it, and asked them what they did. And, and then I set my list of priorities, and I want a creative involvement and relative, uh, relative line of advancement um, relative security, which coming from acting is just about anything. Um, and I started taking some interviews and got, a, got offered a job in television development at Sony Pictures Television um, as a low-level executive. And I was very lucky. I had a, a woman as my mentor who liked being a mentor. And so I say often when people make transitions, you know, they ask, how do we do it? And I say, well, you've got to come up with your best pitch and then hope you meet somebody who's willing to take the risk. And so I was lucky. I did. Um, I was a develop, uh, TV development executive for about five years, Sony and then 20th Century Fox Television. We had a pretty good run and developed shows like King of the Hill, Family Guy, the first round of Family Guy before I got canceled. Um, Yes, Dear Titus, um, uh, a bunch of other shows. So, but I wanted to, at that point to now get closer to the creative process again. Um, I was not in love with being in the corporate culture. So I, I, I got a job running the television development division for a small company named Industry Entertainment. Their managers are still around. At the time, they had a phenomenal roster. It was like... Billy Bob Thornton and Angelina Jolie and DJ Caruso and, uh, I mean, Toby McGuire. It was a spectacular roster of, of clients. Um, and I was very lucky in that I met a lot of those people, and especially on the writer-director side, developed more shows, got more shows on the air, um, ended up, uh, the most successful of the ones I did was Hope and Faith. Um, so I worked with them for about four years and then went out on my own for about four years as a independent producer. I had a deal at ABC Studios. And then the market was starting to change um, and uh, I had always wanted to be a director. And I finally, and by now I think I was age 40, I said I think I finally know enough to do, uh, know enough to do it. So I, uh, I lived on savings and unemployment for about a year and a half and shadowed uh, a lot of directors in television. And then ultimately just started getting a little episode here, 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 and, and built uh, somewhat of a career. Um, it's now been 12 years, um, and um, just like acting, always looking for my next job. Um, but I love it, and it truly does call on everything I learned, both as an actor, as an executive, um, and, uh, and so I, 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 love, I love what I do now. I still occasionally develop a few things. Not a lot. Um, I prefer directing if I can get it. And I think we should share the email you sent me that brought about this, oh, okay. my invitation to ask, ask you to speak. So I'll say that in the last year I was in a, uh, I was directing a show with, um, and it was actually I think my first day, and uh, we had the last scene of the episode, which happened to be, or one of the last scenes, a huge emotionally climactic scene. And one of the actors, and I use that in a gender neutral way, I'm not going to tell you he or she. Um, one of the actors um, was having a really, really hard time finding the scene. Generally, in television, I'll do maybe two masters, three at the max, before I push in and start getting closer coverage. 
I was now getting to my seventh and eighth master because there was not a single scene that I could use as, as, a, as a template. Um, and I was trying everything. And at one point, you know, I asked the classic question, I says, well, what do you want from, from him? And the actor responded, well, it doesn't matter what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I know what I'm doing. I know what I got to do. And they could do whatever they want because I'm going to do my thing. <laughs> and I tried. I kept saying, well, well, don't you think? And basically, I was just completely shut down. Like, no. And so I got home that night and I wrote Howard. I said, please tell your actors, no scene exists if you don't want something from the other person. Hallelujah. It doesn't exist. The scene doesn't exist. Um, it was a horrible four hours of directing. It was, and no matter what I did, I got shot down. Um, and then, but then at the same time, I realized there was nothing I could do. And I just, I did my best to then direct the other actor. And despite this other actor's saying, I found, and this is what I proceeded to do for the rest of the shoot, is that if I directed the other actor enough in a direction that that I needed or wanted, it forced the actor that wouldn't be directed to make choices that they didn't realize. And it was the only way I could semi-direct a scene, was to work really with the other actor, and I would be really, I had to be very specific and, and, and make sure that they didn't mirror what they were getting and make sure that they were really after their objective and so on. And they tended to welcome it, and that, kind of got the scenes closer um, and it was a trick I've now learned to do when I can't when I have an actor that won't be directed so but yeah that was just a, a rough yes. so that's why I'm here and he said oh well you've got to come March 23rd <laughs> <laughs> this was like last year sometime yes because okay. I wanted you all to hear it reinforced uh, please like our page please share our page please send us questions for director Emil Levizetti uh, this question is from Marilyn McIntyre, faculty member who is currently in Australia. Hi, Marilyn. Uh, what is the first thing you look for when an actor walks into the room for an audition or a meeting? You know, I, I, I don't know if I can answer what the first thing I look for is. What I will say, and I've said this at other times when Howard's invited me here, is Every time the door opens, everybody in that room hopes you are the role. Because if you're the role, the job's done. And then we cast, which is the greatest thing in the world. So uh, I guess I look for um, a sense of confidence. Not that that's critical. Somebody can be very nervous and still be brilliant, but a sense that they have a real take on the character, they know what they want, um, and and they're kind of focused and want to do it. I, you know, uh, I don't personally find a lot of shaking hands and greeting and all the rest of that to be necessary, and even at times it's I find it to be a little much. It's like everybody's busy, they're really working hard, totally understand that you've prepared all day for this moment and maybe two or three days. I'm most interested in seeing you come in, give me your take, be directed if, you, if we have a, 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 a comment. And that's it. Great. This is from Brooke Becker, who's here, there. Uh, what is the number one thing an actor can do to make your job easier? Know your lines. <laughs> I mean it. Um, I've had, and it becomes increasingly difficult as a series goes on. Um, if you're a guest actor, the most important thing you can do is know your lines, 100%. Know them inside and out, know them backwards, know the other person's lines, know your lines. Um, because generally, um, most of the regulars have their system down, 
and sometimes there's regulars who are awful and don't know their lines, but most of them have their thing and they do it and they're able to do it. The last thing that anybody wants is a guest actor coming in and not knowing and fumbling and this and that. And it's tough because it's a high pressure situation. You're the guest, you don't know anybody. Generally, at most I've said hi to you, or the director said hi, how are you? Great, great to have you, yeah, you're gonna be great. I'll see you in a bit. And then you've talked to hair, you've talked to makeup, and you've been to craft services, and, and now you're just kind of thrown on the set. Okay, you're up. And now you're here in front of the regulars and me and whoever and the producers and we're blocking. And then it's, you know, okay, give us 20 minutes to light and come back and boom, you're on camera. So there's not a lot of time. Um, and if you're lucky, you've gotten a few private rehearsals. Um, most shows do it these days. Um, there's a few that don't. Um, I always insist on it, but there's a few that just say they don't have time. Um, so... Know your lines, know where the camera is, and it's okay to ask. If you don't know, ask the AD, ask me, say, where's the camera? What size are we? Are we gonna shoot from master? Are we pushing in? Are you gonna do whose coverage first? You know, that those are all totally legitimate questions to ask. Um, and then be flexible, be willing to, to, to play with the other actor, you know? Um, and in my experience, the better you know your lines, the more able you are to do that. If you just finish memorizing 10 minutes before in your camper, tendency is you're too focused on remembering the line and you're too nervous about forgetting it and it means you will forget a line and your acting will be stilted because you're focused on saying the words instead of just being. <laughs> That's an advertisement for the studio. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, this is from Sean, who's here. Uh, how much does schooling weigh in your consideration for a role? In that vein, how much of the casting process is based on the resume? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think s schooling comes in a little bit. Um, I think that producers and directors take a look at it. If you're great and you don't have schooling, it I don't think it makes a big difference. Um, I think it comes into play mo more so when and 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 the resume probably more than the schooling, but it, it is taken into account when you're unsure and you've got a couple or three people that you feel have all done a good audition and you're looking, you're trying to figure out, then you kind of go to the resume and say, well, who's been working? Who, where have they worked? Do I know somebody where they work that I could check in on them? Um, where have they studied? Have they gone to school? And, and that's, in my opinion, where it, te it can tip the balance a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I, I'm going to tell you that the shittiest thing about casting is it is a 100% subjective decision based on factors, personal biases, and opinions over which none of you have an ounce of control. And it's the hardest thing. And I have battled with people as a producer and or director because I believe somebody's good and they believe they suck. And it is purely subjective. And in that regard, you can only do the best you can do, and you truly have to understand that after that, the decision is out of your hands. And it has to do with all kinds of things. The look, your voice, you know, how well you did, did you hit this beat, did you that beat? Sometimes it's about one beat that the writer wants. One beat. And sometimes as director, I don't even know what that beat is till later. Or in the casting, as we're looking over the videos, you go, no, they missed that spot right there. And you go, oh. And so it's literally sometimes it's that specific. And sometimes it's, I don't like their hair. <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but that's just a reality. Um, so where you just do the best you can do. We're taking questions from Facebook, from the audience here live. Please send us your questions on Facebook. Like our page, share our page. 
And I want to follow up on the casting. Is it different for film than it is for television? I can only speak to television. Um, so I, I, I can't answer that. Um, my expectation, these, for the most part these days, in all casting, the first thing we're all looking at is just tape. Um, and including your own taped auditions. Um, if you look at a reel, mm -hmm. ever, what makes a good reel, what doesn't? And how long should it be? I know if I'm interested in looking further within a minute or two. Um, I don't think there's any need for a reel to be over five minutes. Generally, I won't watch five. But I don't think anybody will. Um, I think I just, for me, I just want to see really strong acting right up top. Um, now, it depends. Comedy and drama are different, right? So I do think that there's a benefit of having a reel for each, if you do each, um, and know whether you do or don't, you know? Um, if you're really good at drama and not that great at comedy, you don't have to do comedy, you know? Um, I think that... Um, you want to see somebody who is uh, who's just a really good actor, and it should start with you. So I know it's you. So sometimes a reel will start with like a lead of a show, and then then a couple other people, and I don't even know which one's the actor. Sometimes it yeah. takes me a while. And how long will you watch it for? If I really love them, I'll probably watch a couple of scenes. Maybe even three, so that could be four to six minutes, um, and or I'll go find other work and 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 see if I see on the resume that they were an X, Y, or show or, or something. I'll, I'll go say, Let, let's get a copy of that. I just want to see what they did on that. That show similar to ours, or it's very different. Is what we're tone we're looking for. Um, if I'm on the fence, um, I'll probably watch even more to just figure out. And if I'm not interested, probably 30 seconds. Honest. Uh, this is from our own Ian Cardoni. From your experience in development, the corporate side, and directing, how does a truly creative person stay fresh and inspired and authentic in Hollywood? Um, I think you have to find the source of your inspiration. Um, and I think you have to find, yeah, what that is that inspires you and stay connected to it. Whether it's old movies, whether it's great books, whether it's fabulous plays, whether it's art in, the, in an art museum, whatever that is that really inspires you. Um, you know, I've listened to a bunch of interviews of David O. Russell, and he sees scenes as music. And he's, so it's clear that what inspires him is, is music. And if you haven't, you should listen to his speech at BAFTA. Uh, I don't know, it was a while ago. It's brilliant. But he speaks a lot about that, about how he sees scenes as music. It's not how I see them, but it's, it's brilliant the way he describes. So it was, it's obvious that music is a huge inspiration for him. Um, and then, you, you know, you have to figure out what your defense is to rejection. Um, you know, I have a relative who lost a job recently who, who's been in um, a totally different career and worked for years. First time without a job and being rejected. And he's struggling. And I, I kind of thought to myself, I said, well, I've had... 30 years of rejection. I'm kind of used to it. Because he would say, how do you spend your days? I don't know. I've adapted. Um, so you have to find that way that you still care and that you can allow yourself to mourn at times certain things you really wanted, but that you, they don't crush you or that they crush you momentarily and then that you rebuild. What do they say? It's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. I hate the saying, but there's some truth to it. <laughs> uh, we're taking questions from Facebook. 
from the studio audience. Please like our page, share our page. Australia, wake up, send us more questions. Is Marilyn the only person up over there? Uh, this is from Matthew, who's here. Can you explain a day as a director on set? Sure, your, sure it's your day. So, um, on set as opposed to prep, okay? So prep days are different where it's all about preparing what I'm gonna shoot. But a shoot day would be, um, I probably wake up two to three hours before call. So if it's um, call on a Monday would be 7 a.m. by Wednesday or 9 a.m. and often by Friday you're around 10 or 11 because you push back because there's usually a 12 hour turnaround. If you work 12 hours plus lunch, your minimum day is 13 hours and then actors have 12 hour turnaround. So usually it gets pushed back an hour every day unless you're able to pull in and, and get a day done in less than 12 hours and then you can hold a call time. So um, I'll get up uh, early. If it's not 4 a.m., I might try and get a workout in. If it's a 9 a.m. call, then I'll try and get a workout in have breakfast, get picked up. I like to be on set 45 minutes to an hour ahead of time. Um, different directors have different thing. For me, I like 45 minutes to an hour. It's quiet, the crew hasn't arrived yet. I can sit in the set and I can review my notes and the scenes of the day. It's often then that I will completely change my plan of blocking for the day. Um, I'll have prepared it completely and then I sit down and I completely change it. Um, and then at call time, usually the actors are brought in for a private rehearsal. We will rehearse privately. Then we will uh, bring in the crew for marking. Uh, the crew will come in, mark all the spots, see the rehearsal. Um, then actors are sent back to finish up hair and makeup and wardrobe. The crew begins the light, camera's set up. Um, we then have generally six hours of shooting before lunch. Um, my you know, my job is to try and keep us on time, get the best, and, and at the same time, get the best scenes I can. Um, we then break for lunch. I will often have meetings about the next day, or if there's special effects, or if there's stunts, or something like that. Um, or we'll discuss how the day went, or up to now, or if there's problems, what we need, or if we're behind, what can we do to catch up. Um, generally, um, it's like you know you're making. Oh, it's like the first half of the day you're you're Bernardo Bertolucci, and the second half of the day you're Roger Corman. It's like you know the first half you're trying to do it all, and by the second half you just want to get it done. Um, then you you know have another generally six hours of shooting. It depends on the uh, show and the page count in television. Generally, the minimum page count's five, and it's I've shot up to eleven or twelve pages in a day, um, which is horrid. Um, it very much depends. If it's an action scene, it might be three and a half pages because action takes a lot longer. If it's a courtroom scene and you know you're going to be you know, in this space for a long time, you might get through ten pages in a day. Um, and then at wrap, uh, if there's been problems, I'll have to sit down with the producer and we'll have to figure out how to fix them. If not, I hop in my van, get back to my hotel, and literally get into bed. Generally, the minute I get home, um, I might order a bite from room service. Um, generally, I say that because I've shot in the past 10 years, maybe three shows in LA. Um, so I get into bed right away. I might watch some TV. Um, I've generally done all my prep ahead of time. Um, I'm pretty anal about that, and then I go to sleep and repeat. How much time ahead do you get to prep? It's one day for every day of shooting. So, and those days, um, that's for me when I deal with my anxiety, because it's all about the unknown. Um, we're looking at locations, trying to figure out where to shoot a scene um, and how to shoot it. Um, I am then, once we pick locations, I am trying to figure out the blocking of the scene. Um, oftentimes that is done, you know, on dark stages while they're shooting elsewhere and you gotta be quiet or you're trying to get, you know, you're doing it if you're lucky with your AD and you're walking around and I generally do it by reading the scene and I start to walk around like the character, where I think the character 
and 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 then that's how I start to find where I think it, it lays out um, and I'm planning where I want my cameras um, and my coverage um, I'm looking for angles that I think are really great um, and those days can either be short days where it's just a six hour day and then others where it's really long because then you're also taking meetings with hair, with makeup, with wardrobe, with stunts, with special effects. If there's special effects, you're planning how to shoot those, you're planning what they are, you're pulling resource, reference pictures. Um, same thing with stunts, you're often pulling reference scenes that you know or thought of um, and you're looking at rehearsals of stunts and, and planning those things. Um, and by the end, I have a, a binder where I've blocked out every scene. Um, generally, as long as I've blocked it out ahead of time, then it doesn't matter what happens, I can throw it out. But if I haven't prepped it and blocked it out, then I'm lost. Um, and I, 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 two pieces of advice were given to me by a great director named Bill D'Elia. I was shadowing him on Boston Legal. It was about 13 years ago, 12 years ago. It was, you know, Boston Legal, James Spader, and William Shatner. And I said, how do you pre-block the scenes? He goes, I don't. I said, well, I don't understand. He said, well, I've got Spader and Shatner. If I tried to do something, they'd tell me to fuck off and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. And, and he said, um, but I'll give you a couple of tips. He said, one, put the props where you want the actor to be. So I do that now all the time. You just, if they have a clipboard, if they have a cup of coffee, if they've got to answer a phone, I put it where I want them to be. And he said, stand where you want the camera to be, because they will just instinctively work around you. So I tend to try and do that, um, unless I see the DP standing on a completely opposite place, at which point he probably sees an angle I don't, and I'll run over there and see what he sees. Um, and then the other thing he said, which I've used many, many times, is you'll often have this incredible shot planned. You're like, this is what I'm going to do. It's going to be incredible. This, and then the sun's in the wrong place. The didn't you didn't get the piece of equipment you thought. The actor won't do that. Won't won't stand there. Won't do that. Right. And you've got to find a new shot. And and he gave me a piece, simple piece of advice, which I've used over and over in my own head, which is, there's always another shot. So in the beginning of my career, you know, when you think you've got this great shot planned and you can't do it, you think, oh my God, I'm fine. You know, what am I going to do? It's, I, and you panic. And I would just say to myself, there's always a and you just calm, look, find the other shot. Great. We're taking questions from Facebook, from the studio audience live. Please share our page. Please like our page. Send in your questions for director Emil Levizetti. This is from Facebook. What is your favorite part of the process as a director? Um, actually shooting and directing. And when, um, there's no question, when I have two talented actors who know their lines and are, I, I mean, I, I can't say it enough because it's, it's serious. I mean, it, it's a huge difference between those who do and those who don't. So much so that I can just play with them and I can say, okay, that was great. Let's try another one. Let's try it this way. Let's try it that way. Sometimes I know exactly what I want in a scene, and I'll get it, but then it's worth trying something else to see what happens. But the most fun, and, and, and I, I'll have to say I've had some of my greatest times with some of the actors on Suits, is just being able to play and just say, because they know it so well, we can say, well, what if you did it this way? What if you did that? And sometimes you find brilliant moments. And that, to me, hands down, is the most fun when I can play with two actors and I see them connect and I see their energy and um, that's when I will literally be like, yes, behind the, you know, behind the monitor. Yes, God! You know, I mean, just ecstatic. That's, without a doubt, the best. Thank you. How collaborative is the process in television with costumes, with lighting, with set decoration? Um, every show is slightly different, but generally it's quite collaborative. Um, 
I generally, um, especially with women's wardrobes, there has been an extensive approval process. I, as a director, tend to just not get involved. I've just I've been down that road, and it's not. There's networks and studios and people with very firm opinions about what they want, and so generally, I just say whatever you want there. Um, Hair, makeup, and wardrobe in that, it's only really if there's something special. Like either if there is a formal scene or where, you know, it's obvious we have to be in formal wear and, and or then how do we want that? Or if there's servers in a restaurant, I know this sounds odd, tinky, but those are, those are like the only real places. Because otherwise the regulars, they have their thing. And they, the regulars generally have, the series regulars, they have a very strong dialogue with hair, makeup, and costume, and they are, they know what they're doing. Um, if I feel strongly about something, I might have a conversation with them and say, what do you think about this? Um, but that, I leave alone. I tend to work very collaboratively with the production designer. I tend to have a very clear vision in my head of what I want a space to look like. And I've found most production uh, designers to be really open to that and, and collaborative and, and enjoy working with my ideas. And that's a place where I can have a lot of creativity and fun. And it's also a place as a guest director coming into series where I can have an effect. Because otherwise, the regular sets have been, have been dressed, everything's set. But for, you know, it, it's those swing sets and or those locations where I can actually change the look of an episode by what I choose. Um, and then I work intensely collaboratively with the director of photography um, as we're planning shots. And again, I tend to have a really clear idea sometimes if I want a certain scene to be really dark or if I want it to have a look like, you know, like the fluorescent greens or blues or, or, or stuff like that. So those are the places where I will work most collaboratively. Um, and then there is some collaboration with the writer, um, depending on the show, in terms of what they want and then what I see. But generally in TV, the writer's the boss. And so I'm downloading what they are interested in seeing and, and figuring out how to integrate it. Um, if I'm lucky enough to have a writer on set, then um, I will usually give my version, and if they have a problem, they'll say, oh, well, you know, you're missing this beat, or I'd like you to you try it this way. And so then it's collaborative there. But the main collaboration is the director of photography, uh, the producer who's in control of the money in, in deciding what locations we can afford and what equipment we can afford, um, and the production designer. Those are the three main places of, big, of collaboration in television. Great. This is from Facebook. Uh, with the amount of new television and also streaming sources and different forms of content, has that affected the landscape and your own job? Yes, it has. Um, you know, it is, a, it is a changing landscape all over the place. There are many more options and at the same time more limited options. Um, the Generally, more content is better, um, and so there's been a lot more options. And at the same time, you know, a lot of these places, Netflix, Hulu, HBO, um, have really adopted um, much more significant relationships with major filmmakers, you know, um, with uh, like David Fincher, obviously House of Cards, and, and so on. So a lot of those bigger Tiffany places have developed significant relationships with big feature film guys. And so that's made it more difficult in some direct ways because a lot of times those things you'd like to do aren't necessarily available. Um, but generally more is better and there are a lot of options. Okay, This is from Facebook. Do you have final say in the casting process and does social media play a role? Okay. I do not have final say in the process. The executive producers do. This is television. Um, feature films, generally the director is the boss, but still will need approval by the producers. Um, 
for the most part in television right now, um, the major guest roles often by the time I get there have even been cast. Um, or I get an email saying, we'd like to place an offer to so-and-so. Are you okay with that? Um, so the writer slash executive producer in television is the boss. The, the buck stops with them. Um, and so generally in, in normal casting, I would look at a lot of tapes. Used to be I'd see people in person. Now it's almost exclusively tape. Um, and then I will pick my top three choices, and then I will submit them to the producers, and then they will pick who of the top three they like I want to cast. Sometimes if there's not three, I'll say two, and so occasionally I'll say, look, I only see this one person. If they don't like them, then they'll say, well, we go back and look for more people. Um, social media, I have not found to be an influence in television casting. Now, I can't say that it doesn't perhaps happen at the studio or network level when they're looking for a big guest star and they say, you know, look, this person has, it's called stunt casting, look, this person has five million followers, whatever, I think we should give them a shot. I have not run across that personally. I can't tell you unequivocally that it doesn't happen. Um, I certainly would rebel against it if it were pushed in my face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Uh, that said, you know, the, the Rock gets paid, um, because he's got so many followers, The Rock now gets paid both for his acting services, producing services, and he gets a separate payment in the millions of dollars for his marketing services on his Instagram. Because he has so many followers, he is able to demand more money, a separate check in the millions, because of his social influence on, on social media. Okay. <laughs> this is from Australia, from Robert Snars, one of our graduates. What power balance is there on set between what an actor won't do and what you insist they must do? <laughs> <laughs> um, it often depends on the actor um, and the director, I think. Um, ideally, it is uh, a process of finding the best solution. I almost always have an idea of what I want, but if an actor says, well, I'd really like to try this way, I will always say, well, let's try it that way and see what happens. Um, often they're great ideas and often they're horrible ideas. Um, so then it becomes a process of how can I um, massage and or get what I want while not shutting the actor down. Um, I always say a good idea is a good idea. I don't care who it comes from. If, a, if it comes from a PA and it's a great idea, I'll take it. Um, I don't have any problem with that. You know, there are actors that um, come with, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of weight and that becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, and it's really kind of, you know, you, you, you're, you, it's a dance that you're trying to figure out. I remember the very first scene I shot with Peter Gallagher on Covert Affairs, within the first two sentences, he said, well, the, Bob, the two Bob Alvin movies I did. <laughs> and I thought, okay, all right. And he really um, challenged me on a lot of my choices. And, but I discussed them and we went back and forth and at the end of the day he goes, you are right kid, I like you. Um, and he's been great ever since and, 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 and nice guy. So the power balance is whatever the actor and the director chooses it to be, I hate to say. It's however, if an actor chooses to say, fuck you, this is what I'm doing, then usually there's not a lot I can do. And um, 
I, for the most part, will never say that because that ends up shutting somebody down. Great. This is from Facebook. Can you discuss continuity? Lately, I've heard many directors have become more open to each take being unique instead of having to replicate the take before. What are your thoughts on this? It's a really interesting question because um, continuity really affects more than anything in the edit um, when you're trying to put everything together. Um, ironically, I, I think that continuity is, is more significant with physical action than it is necessarily with um, emotional continuity. Because as long as we're getting a lot of different choices um, in terms of tone or in terms of the acting, I can make that work in editing. It, it, it it's more has to do with if somebody turns, let's say, we're following, they turn every time at a different place. Most significantly, it's going to affect our ability to edit the best performance out of you. So remember that what the director and the editor and the producers are always doing is trying to build what they believe is the best performance of the actor in that scene and how it shapes the arc of the episode, where it fits. So if you do everything differently, every single take, it's going to limit what we can stitch together. So you might have nailed a moment in the first take that you completely botched in the third take, but you nailed a different moment in the fourth take. The beauty of editing, and this is the magic of filmmaking, is we can put one and four together and make you look amazing. Um, <laughs> if, however, the blocking, if you have changed the blocking or done it so inconsistently that it's really jarring, then that can become a real problem. Um, and or if, let's say, you're doing a scene and it's close up, it, generally the continuity is not important in the master. Find your things what you like. As you get in tighter, then you want to try to become a little more consistent. Again, for me, the consistency relatively in terms of physical action is a little more important than it is in the acting I'm fine with all kinds of choices because then I can put it together. But especially if it's like a close up and either you have a, let's say you have a scar, you have a cigarette or you've got a drink. If you're drinking at a different place every single time, it may end up looking like you're drinking all through the scene. <laughs> You know, or you're limiting me and I can't use that moment. It's also important to be aware that you have more flexibility when the other actor is talking to make it, to move or make a change. I may want a reaction shot and that may be a reaction I use while I'm, while they're talking. But if you're doing the change while you're talking, it either has to be good and I like it and it works, or generally we'll end up hearing your line and watching the other actor. Mm -hmm. So there's no hard and fast rule. Um, relative consistency helps, but it's also, um, you know, it's not, I don't think, live or die, but it, 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 it affects our ability to cut. That's the most, that's the most important thing to understand. When you are having a conversation with an actor, let's say that maybe he's up for a role. What are the turn-ons and turn-offs in a, that conversation? I think I'm just, I, I, I'm interested in passion and, 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 and interest and curiosity. Um, I, I think that curiosity and imagination are two things I always want to see and hear about. Um, and um, I guess those would be the things, I think, more okay. than anything. Do you get a sense of somebody's personality very quickly, whether they're open, whether they might collaborate or not? Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I think that if you are asking smart questions and you're expressing your passion for the project, um, 
that's what's really most important. I think passion, what you like about the project, what you um, maybe something it reminded you of, um, you know, what you like about the role, what you really like about um, the other characters, um, something in a character that you found like scary or despicable that really like you thought was fun. Um, generally, these days, we're not taking that many meetings anymore. It's it's tape. We're watching tape, and then if you're taking a meeting, and this goes back to my studio days, if you've got an offer subject to a meeting, it generally means it's a name actor who feels they no longer have to audition, and so they won't audition. You're still interested in that actor, but you're saying, look, I'm not going to offer this role or give it to them without sitting down with them for an hour, in which case the agent says, okay, well, you've got to make us an offer subject to a meeting. So that means the offer is on the table, and unless the meeting goes horribly wrong, they're going to get that role. Um, and um, I think then at that point you are interested to hear exactly what I talked about, like just passion, curiosity, excitement, interest, um, and a flexibility and a communication. You know, I'm sure you've interviewed actors that you didn't want in your studio within about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm turning know. it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you turn this interview back around. Uh, this is from Alex Poe, who's back there. And if I can share, is a descendant of Edgar Allan. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, what kind of direction do you give during mm -hmm. rehearsal and in between takes? What are some of the typical directions you might give an actor? Um, rehearsal, I tend to give much more just blocking. I, 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 unless it's a significant, significant emotional scene, and even then, at times, I don't, I don't want to get too deep into the acting before the cameras are rolling. Um, so rehearsal for me is much more about the blocking, the interaction of the actors, the physicality, and to, a, to some degree, their intent and or their energy, you know? But a lot of times that is not how an actor wants to work. Um, uh, I will say that um, my personal opinion is that if you wear a specific pair of shoes as your role, I personally think you should do your rehearsal in those shoes. Um, understanding that a lot of times those high heels are really uncomfortable. Um, it makes a huge difference um, to see how somebody moves and walks in there as opposed to their Uggs. Um, <laughs> and it often is like a, then a rejiggering also with lights with like, oh shit, they were, you know. So um, that's the rehearsal. In between takes, Hopefully, in the rehearsal, like I say, we've got the general shape of it. Um, now, I'm wanting to fine tune. Um, again, in the beginning, in the master, I'm not going to give too many specific acting directions unless I feel they're really off the rails. You know, if somebody in my mind should be bursting into a room full of rage and they're kind of walking in. Um, I'll want to ask them why they make that choice. I try to ask more questions before I give directions. Say, I'm curious why you made that choice, um, and and um, okay, and I'll listen to it. And then sometimes I'll say, okay, let's try that. And then would you be open to trying maybe something that you know? Let's say this has been uh, you know boiling in you for the past three hours, and you're ready to burst. And and, and that you know, I'd love to see. Would you be open to trying that? Um, as we get closer with the camera, um, then I will become more specific about moments, beats. Um, ideally, their objective is clear, but I will often say, as, as an example, is like, what do you need from the other person? Um, and how are you going to get it? Um, I will talk about obstacles. Um, I'll say, you know, this person just keeps throwing obstacles in your way, and you're not getting what you want. What are you going to do? 
Um, sometimes actors don't want to know that. There's some actors say, just give me a line reading. What are you looking oh. for? <laughs> Somebody say, you know, because I will try to never do that. And sometimes I feel like they're missing a beat. And sometimes they'll say, just give me, just give me a line reading. What do you want here? Oh, God. Okay. Um, even then, I tend not to do it. Um, so, um, yeah, it's as we get closer is when I start te tweaking and looking at beat and beat and beat and looking for, you know, how does that affect you? Um, don't be afraid to slow down or, you know, this scene that right now is feeling a little slow. I think we need to find the energy. And, and, and that often happens in the late afternoon. People are tired. It's after lunch. And sometimes you just, people are dragging and you got to kind of literally just remember, like, guys, wake up, you know. Um, and that's not necessarily a great acting direction, but sometimes you just have to say it. You just have to say, we got to move. The scene is now the whole movie. Um, how, how open is the casting process? Um, it's becoming more closed. Um, open in what way? In other words, does the network give you a list that you've got to choose from? Um, or that they approve of? Or? Well, the network uh, has to approve everybody, period, in the story. Um, if it's a one-line role, then maybe they don't approve it. But generally, the network cast directors approve every single person on that show, um, no matter what role. Um, generally, like I say, I'm, get, I'm seeing the greatest number, narrowing it down, showing it to the producers. They're picking the ones they want, presenting it to the studio and the network. And the studio network is either saying yes or no. And sometimes they say no. Um, and then you go back. Um, more and more these days, because of the speed and because of the way everything works, if they are looking for, they know they've got, let's say, a big guest star coming or a big guest starring role that might be one episode or it really important or it might be a three episode arc, they will often, the producers will often start to see those tapes um, way before I, I'm around. And um, sometimes I find out they've been cast when I arrive. They're like, oh, we cast so-and-so. And, -so. and um, other times they, I get a courtesy email. Um, and then other times, if we're still in the process, then you know I can give my feedback. But a lot of times these days, it's, uh, it's moving along. And this is from Sally McLean in Australia. Hi, Sally. She's a producer, director, actress, and faculty member. What are your thoughts on actors asking to watch playback during filming or rushes generally during the shoot? Generally, we don't have time. Um, and we don't even watch playback for the most part, unless it's an action sequence or a special effects sequence. Generally these days, Ironically, with the way tape is done, they don't like to back it up. Um, they're afraid of problems. Um, I have very rarely been asked by an actor to, 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 to play back. Um, very, very rarely. And generally, like I say, it's really more only when, um, when it's a big action sequence, a big action take or a special effect take when you need to make sure you got what you need before you move on. But if it's, you know, just, you know, acting or so on, I, I, I don't think I've ever been asked. And generally, I think the answer would, would be, I would say, well, what are you looking for? What do you need? What do you feel? And because generally we don't have a lot of time. Um, and I would try to say, what can I help you with? Is there something you didn't like? Is there something you're not feeling? And I would try to reassure the actor if um, I felt that they were not being their own best judge, or I would, um, uh, if I thought they had a great say, well, if you feel that way, why don't we just try it again and, and <laughs> do it again? Will you give an actor another take when they want one? Um, most of the time, yeah. And it, uh, ideally, if things are going well, and I've gotten what I want, I love to be able to say, okay, now it's yours, do whatever you want. And the number of times that that's the best take is 70%. Wow. Um, because I, and that's why I like to do it. I'll just say, all right, I got what I want, do whatever you want. And 
and then all of a sudden they come alive. That the pressure is off, and now they can play. Yeah, they feel like it's not. It, it doesn't matter anymore. They got and, and oh. they just let themselves go, and it's often brilliant. <laughs> um, and unless we're and, and we're often really under the gun. And I, I, I hate to say this, if a series regular, if one of the leads says, I'd like another take, you tend to give them the take. If a guest star says, could I have another take, and you're under the gun, often you just say, I'm sorry, I just don't have time. And that's where a little bit of just the hierarchy of, of the set goes. Um, and uh, But there's been times when a lead has said, Can I, and I would say, I think you're amazing, I think we got a great take, we're really behind. Are you, are you, would you be okay if we went ahead, or, or do you really want one? And sometimes they'll go, no, nah, all right, it's fine. And other times they go, no, I really want one. I go, okay, let's do it. And then you do. Yeah. Final thoughts that you want to share with the actors here or those watching? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I've talked too much already. Oh, no, you're wonderful. No. Um, We're so appreciative that you're here. You know, um, no, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really not sure. I mean, if you want to ask me some more questions, I'll, I'll be glad. Well, it, words of inspiration. <laughs> um, you talk about you having to handle rejection and hustle for work. So maybe it's good for everybody to know that pretty much everybody at every level creatively is doing that. Oh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm constantly rejected right now um, as a director. Um, and not getting jobs I want constantly. Um, and um, I think that, you know, I, I will say that your piece of advice about course corrections has stuck with me over the, over the decades, because it's been that long. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know what you're referring to. <laughs> Barely 21. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I think that Acting is an incredible craft that is insanely difficult to do well. Um, and the actors that are able to really, in a way, lose themselves in the role while still maintaining their sanity mm -hmm. um, are, are a thrill to work with. Um, those that lose themselves and become insane are not a thrill to work with. Um, it is, I think, an, uh, um, that if, if you can find that ability to be in the moment and still fight for what you're fighting for while being flexible in the moment to respond to what you're getting um, is amazing. And, and those that can really do it are, are, are like I say, are an inspiration to watch. Um, my personal feeling is you keep doing it until you just feel you just can't. Um, and like for me, it was 10 years. And then I just felt, you know what, I want other things in my life. Um, for other people, it may be 20 or 30 years. And for other people, it may be never. And they, that's just, that gives them their happiness. And I think that's amazing. I think that you should do whatever you can do to find your passion and find what makes you happy and recognize when it's not making you happy. And t do the soul searching to, re to, to, to figure out, is it the craft? Is it you? Is it your past? Do you need therapy? Um, you know, I mean it, because ultimately you might be really happy doing one play a year and, and taking class and waiting tables, and that might make you really happy, and then I have no judgment. I mean, if you're happy, you're happy. God bless you. And for others, um, you know, the ambition and, and, and the need for success is much, much greater. And as a result, much harder to attain. Um, I think that the, the toughest thing I'll say is there is a huge amount of luck involved. Um, and I rebel against it every time somebody says it. 
but it's true. There's a huge amount of luck, and you know they say preparation and opportunity um, help determine your luck. You know, if you're prepared and you get the opportunity, then you might get lucky. So, um, but I guess I I always believed in you. Just got to follow your passion and, and 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 fight for what you believe in, and recognize when you're hitting a brick wall, and 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 have the sense to. If you need to make a course correction, for me it made me much happier to change um, careers, and I've been uh, so. Th I guess yeah. Excellent. Thank you.